Well, initially he became famous on a global basis uh, for his discovery of uh, invention, really, of the lightning rod, um, which was something that both scientifically and culturally broke new ground. Um, and even though scientists in Europe had been working on this problem of what is thunder and lightning for many years, they hadn't really solved it. Franklin was the first person to put together a kind of total theory of electricity that explained what it was and also, as part of it, explained that thunder and lightning were electrical, natural electrical phenomena. Um, and sort of the capstone to this was that he invented the lightning rod, which would go on people's homes, obviously, and intercept a bolt of lightning. Now this was, we take it for granted, of course, we've had them around for years, but in Franklin's day, this was considered a completely revolutionary idea. Uh, and of course, it, it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, mostly the church uh, at first, had trouble uh, accepting the idea that mere mortals were able to actually deter thunder and lightning, which had forever been considered sort of like a uh, something that, you know, a, a sign of God's wrath, so to speak. Um, so Franklin actually got into, a, there was squabbles uh, over this, whether or not he should, you know, what the light, the efficacy of the lightning rod, whether it's what it was proper or not. In New England, they accused the lightning rod of causing an earthquake. He got into a huge dispute over that, or at least what they called the Franklinists, people who supported him would sort of go to bat for him. Um, uh, but um, that's really how he first became well known. I mean, he of course was well known in Philadelphia as a journalist, uh, a printer, and as a tradesman. Uh, but really it's the lightning rod that first garnered him worldwide attention. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that, of course, he'd been in correspondence with people at the Royal Society in London, which was the world's preeminent scientific organization. And he'd been writing them letters for years about his electrical experiments, which he considered just to be sort of his own hobby, like tabletop experiments. And unbeknownst to him, they were very impressed by these letters. And finally, someone from the Royal Society said to, wrote him and said, We're, we want to publish these in a book. These, you're, you're, you're coming up with incredible stuff. And he was, you know, after a moment, he thought, well, okay, that sounds great. So he revised his own letters, made them a little sharper in terms of the prose and explanations. And this book was published, uh, I believe, in 1752. Uh, it was very Newtonian. It was like experiments and observations in electricity by Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia. Well, of course, that in itself was a startling to people in England and Europe. First of all, Philadelphia, no real science had come out of America at all. I mean, New Jersey at the time was still like a place where they would send people who couldn't pay their debts and other undesirables. The idea that someone from Philadelphia who was just a printer had actually cracked the secret of electricity. And not only that, but had also suggested this device, which would be life-saving and property-saving was phenomenal to them. And a lot of people at first thought were inclined to think it was a fraud, that actually Benjamin Franklin must be some noted scientist at a big university in Europe, what have you. So that in itself, in, that always was part of his fame abroad especially, was that he was basically, as one, I think a French woman described him, he was like a clodhopper, in other words. It, and he played that up, of course, always, that he was a kind of person from the frontier, uh, sort of a rough-hewn character from the colonies. Uh, but the fact that he came up with this world-class science didn't fool the scientists at the Royal Society at all. And when he himself went to England later, uh, he was heralded as a, a great man and given honorary doctorates and this kind of thing. I think it sort of shaped all his thinking in a way, and his diplomatic thinking specifically, uh, in that, especially when he went to France uh, during the war of in American War of Independence, um, he adopted a very kind of easygoing, uh, he believed, like electricity that just sort of flowed, he believed in sort of a very low-key diplomatic presence. Uh, just, he became kind of French in a way, he took up wine drinking, staying up late, going to soirees, 
uh, he had an eye for the ladies. Uh, he was, you know, loved wonderful meals and dinner parties. And uh, when John Adams, in fact, his co-diplomat, came over a little later, uh, he was sort of astounded. He thought Franklin had, you know, gone too far and was not being sort of stern or strict enough with himself. But by then, it was too. Adams found himself on the outs because it was Franklin who the French had embraced. They loved him. They thought he, uh, they, the. Uh, Jacques Turgot, who was the Controller General of France, had this saying that Franklin had snatched thunder from the gods and the um, s uh, scepter from kings. Uh, that this was who this person was. He stood up to royalty, uh, obviously the American Revolution, and that he had solved this riddle of what caused this devastating natural phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's of course, it's. We all know today, too, thunder and lightning are very much to be feared. It's an enormous, powerful burst of natural energy that can be very destructive. But we have to remember that in the 18th century, nobody really knew what this, what it was. And it was, it was shrouded in all kinds of superstition, mystery. And the idea that this man had discovered its secret, basically, was extremely powerful. Um, so Franklin was beloved by the French people. and even by a lot of the, what they call the, the physiocrats in France, the sort of leading economists. Um, so to answer your question, uh, I think his science, his sort of confidence in the natural origin of the, the phenomenon of thunder and lightning, um, uh, his sense that uh, everything would sort of play out in time in terms of diplomacy if you didn't press too hard, that was always his approach toward the French. Uh, I, I do think there was a connection. Certainly when Franklin took part in the, the writing of the Constitution, for instance, uh, he was by then very old, but he brought to it a kind of sense, a sort of Newtonian sense in experimentation, a faith in experimentation and observation. Uh, and I believe he saw the Constitution as a kind of great experiment and was thus willing to kind of see it. He wanted to put it in motion and he had that kind of faith in it. Um, so in that sense, I think it did. His, it made him, his science made him very uh, questioning and open-minded. Obviously, those are traits that transfer very well to someone who's uh, a revolutionary or someone who's a reformist like Franklin was. Well, that was simply that, as I mentioned a little earlier too, when, when Franklin, uh, Franklin had been in England a few times um, while still, you know, Franklin was very, very much an Anglophile and he actually thought of moving to Britain at one point. He liked it so much. Uh, but then he ran afoul of the British government in that as the antagonism between the colonies and Britain heated up, uh, Franklin ca got caught up in uh, as he put it, I'm being, I'm too much of an American. Uh, specifically, he was charged with um, uh, sending letters that had been given to him in confidence from the colonial governor to the crown, uh, asking, saying that perhaps more British troops would be needed in the colonies. And Franklin then sent these letters back to symp sympathizers in Boston of, of the American cause. Well, when the crown found out, they were livid at him, even though he may have had more innocent motives in terms of, well, maybe he just wanted to show, share this information, or, but obviously it looked bad, and he was called before a consul and sort of chastised in public. And after that, there was sort of no doubt in Franklin's mind that he would side with the American Revolution, and he left Britain a short time later. So when he went to France, the American Revolution had already begun. And so the French welcomed him. They saw, for one thing, the French loved any chance to kind of get a dig in against the British. So the idea that this man now was in France, and you know, you have to remember that he lived in France for many, many years, the entire course of the Revolutionary War, basically. Um, and just as I mentioned before, he was a person who understood that his own rough aspect, his dress, he wore a kind of a fur hat and what he called Quaker shoes and uh, always dressed in a kind of uh, very American way. Uh, but the French were delighted. 
uh, with this and found him. They just loved this kind of idea that he had come from the new world and had all these attributes of the common man. And yet at the same time, of course, he was known and applauded for this stroke of scientific genius. And of course, it's, we should mention that the lightning rod was just one of many of his scientific breakthroughs. He had also invented a musical instrument, which the French were charmed with, the harmonica, which was called glass music. Um, even while serving in France as a diplomat, he invented bifocals because he found that when he would go to diplomatic dinners, uh, he wanted to be, he loved food, he wanted to be able to see what was on his plate. At the same time, he needed to see the lips and faces of the people across from him because he didn't speak French very well. And so to follow what was being said to him, which was of course important, he was the American envoy, he found it frustrating because he couldn't do both things. So he went home from one of these engagements and took several pairs of his glasses and decided, well, just cut them up. And so he put them together so that, of course, you could have one lens do one function and the other the other. And so, hence, bifocals. So he was always inventing, always... One thing that's amazing, if you look at Franklin's papers, is even when he was in the midst of the most intense sort of diplomatic discussions or negotiations, he was always carrying on an elaborate scientific correspondence with people all over the world. Uh, lengthy letters, diagrams, charts, sharing findings, reporting on different people's experiments and stuff. So that's what always seemed to really like it made his mind so active. Well, there's of course that funny story about, I mean, again, the, the, the sort of antagonism between he and John Adams is amusing, I think, when they're in France, in that Adams was kind of shocked by Franklin. He thought Franklin would really let his hair down, so to speak, and Adams was much more uptight. Uh, the funny thing is there was a, prior to their both going to France, there was an interesting moment between, they'd known each other for years, and once going to a parley with the British in Staten Island in, I think, 1776 it must have been, um, they had to share a room in a boarding house or a hotel overnight. And you know, Franklin was a fresh air fiend Every morning he took what he called an air bath where he would sit naked in front of a window. And so he loved to have the window open at night. Well, Adams said, I, I want the window closed. It's too cold. Uh, and Franklin, they got into an argument about it. Finally, Franklin persisted, and so the window was open. But Adams always held it against him. And even years later, Adams was still complaining about this evening when Franklin had insisted on having the window open. Um, uh, but there... The drama between them while they were in France was kind of significant. I think he, I think it was he was an obvious choice to go abroad for the U.S. because at home he had already distinguished himself as someone of calm judgment, and uh, even here in Philadelphia as a tradesman, as a printer, uh, he was someone who people would come to. Uh, they saw in him a kind of a person who was a sound arbiter, uh, a shrewd businessman, but fair, uh, someone devoted to the civic good, uh, and who always seemed to have the most people's interest at heart. Uh, he'd been active, of course, also in a lot of very technical things in terms of unifying the colonies, uh, the Continental Congress. Uh, and so, in a way, it was an easy choice because people saw in him a kind of genial older person, he was, remember he was 70 years old when he went to France, um, who would be able to bring, represent the American interests uh, well. And it's important to remember too that of course the American Revolution was, I mean, as far as we're concerned, it's a long done deal, but at the time it was a complete flyer. I mean, it, as you know, the, the, the idea that the Americans would win would actually force the British to relinquish the colonies was the bets were not good for many, many years. Um, you know, it was an incredible thing. Of course, the French helped eventually by helping to corner General, the British General Cornwallis at Yorktown by sending their ships. Cornwallis had nowhere to go. The French were there. Uh, and so um, the idea that Franklin was trying to argue the Americans' case to get money, to get help, assistance, uh, was a very important role, very key. And the fact that, uh, like I said, a lot of people were amazed when it turned out that 
the revolution actually succeeded. And I think a large part of it was the fact that Franklin always was able to keep this solid alliance with France going over the many years of the revolution. I do, I'm willing to give Franklin the benefit of the doubt. I mean, um, it would have been, I know that there has been talk, it would have been completely unlike him to fabricate something like that, given everything I know about his scientific work. It just wouldn't be in his interest. I mean, for one thing, he published, Franklin was a person who didn't, he never patented anything. He didn't believe, he wasn't a kind of jealous person trying to claim something that wasn't, that wasn't his style. Uh, he, was, he always assumed that anything he invented would be taken by other people and used. Uh, he published uh, the reason someone else had, the, someone did a similar experiment in France based on Franklin's own writing. So he had put the, he had written the experiment down basically uh, for anyone to do before he himself got around to doing it with the kite. Uh, it was in the summer of 1752. Um, so I've always been convinced that he did do it with the help of his son, William. And it's also important to remember that I think a lot of people think that the kite was struck by lightning, but that isn't all he was doing was showing that the atmosphere was electrified in the presence of a thunderstorm. So it's a little, it wasn't quite as, it's often depicted as being a little more melodramatic than it really was. Yeah, I hope that you, I think I sort of hit it, you know, just that he is, his, the main thing is his popularity uh, in Europe and France was enormous. Um, I mean, he, at one point he said to his daughter, he wrote, I'm as popular as the man on the moon here. Um, you know, it's, he was overwhelmed by it, uh, but he was able to parlay it, of course. Uh, but uh, that in itself, I think, did, it was almost like celebrity as diplomacy in a way. Uh, it worked very convincingly. They're actually, well, the first member, Cotton Mather had been the first American member of the Royal Society. Um, but yes, they did make him a member. And, um, you know, it's funny because Franklin, he had gone to England when he was a very young man. He was like 20 or 21. And had, when he was there, kind of dreamed about having access to the great scientific minds of England, which, of course, at that time was completely beyond him. He worked as a printer, he gave swimming lessons in the Thames and things like that, but he, he never... So the idea that he, when he went back, then that was very satisfying to him. Um, the fact that he could call himself Dr. Franklin always meant a lot to him. I mean, he was a man, he had a second grade education, basically. So all these things, all the honors, all the accolades, the titles, were hugely important to him. Uh, at one point he went to have dinner with the King of Denmark, and. It moved him so much that he later, actually in his papers there, are, he drew a diagram of the seating arrangement to show how close he had been to the king and this kind of thing. So it's very, it's charming in a way. It's very, almost this kind of childish pleasure he took in all this fame and attention.